Thank you, Mark. All right, good afternoon. I'm excited to be here with this very questioning audience. That's uh, a good thing. Um, I will, um, I'm focusing today on um, uh, one segment of the genome, the chromosomes 1 to 22. And so I've circled the uh, genomics down here on the bottom left. Um, but I do love the word integrating, and I, I wish we could be doing more and more of that. Um, we, we, uh, we do our best with what, what we have. Okay, so moving forward to, um, let's see. Um, so um, the, our genome is, resides in, in our cells. Um, no, that's right. Keep going. Is there a um, laser? Um, our genome resides in our cells, um, but it's scattered around a little bit, and, and, um, and so in this slide here, um, um, I have a, a bunch of the orange wiggly lines, and if you've been to the genome exhibit, you might have seen other representations of these things we call chromosomes. Um, and there's a brighter red one and a, and a lighter yellowish one. The brighter red one is indicating it's a slightly shorter chromosome, the Y chromosome, and the one next to that, the larger, lighter colored one, is the X chromosome. We also have DNA out in these other organelles called mitochondria, little rings of DNA that we inherit from our mothers. And so this is, you know, all together makes up our genome. and. Um, so I want to sh show you know, where um, our ancestry is in, ter in terms of those different parts of our genome. So um, I don't think I can point very well here. Um, um, not any pointer. So um, what we have here is a little family tree, and I'll just show you the family tree. We've got two individuals, a brother and a sister. And what I have imagined when I put this little diagram together is that they, uh, each of them has, they, they have two parents, um, and the, the left hand, the, the boxes are always the, the males, the, the circles are the females. Um, so you've got a, a father and a mother, and then you've got four grandparents and eight great-grandparents. And I'm imagining that the top generation there came from four different continental regions, um, uh, the, um, Father's, father's parents came, let's say, from the purple, showing the purple arrow, arrow, say, from Western Africa. The father's um, um, mother's family came from, let's say, um, Iberia, Southern Europe. Um, the mother's father's family came from Southeast Asia. The mother's, mother's family came from, let's say, um, Eastern South America, say, Brazil. And so, so let's imagine this is a you know, wonderful family that's got ancestors from all these different regions. And how, um, how is that going to look when we map that ancestry onto the genome? And because of the, the way the, the different genomic regions are inherited, what happens is the Y chromosome, which is inherited only from father to son, um, I've colored here purple, uh, reflecting that the the, the, the Y chromosome has traveled from the grand, great grandfather to the far left, and uh, those great grandparents uh, we, we are hypothesizing came from Western Africa. So um, now, on the other hand, to the right, we have the mitochondrial genome, which comes, is inherited from mother to child. So we see that um, I've colored that with the blue color because it is inherited from the mother's mother's family, and that part of the whole family uh, we've suggested uh, immigrated from, um, say, Brazil. And then we look at the rest of the chromosomes, chromosomes 1 to 22. These are called the autosomes. And those chromosomes are so valuable because they capture not just 
you know, one of the lineages of ancestry, but they capture all of those great-grandparents uh, or that, those geographic locations. And so I've color-coded, you'll see these other chromosomes, and they all have four colors because um, uh, if you look at the four grandparents, they have four different colors, and each of those chromosomes uh, gets some material from each of those grandparents. And that's, that's an important concept. So, so this is how um, our ancestry travels you know, uh, through our genome and through our family trees and, and uh, in different parts of our genome. And so um, the, one of the important things to do is to bring all of this information together when we're trying to use DNA to understand our ancestry, to look at the different um, parts of the genome and put it all together like a puzzle. So, and, and another tricky thing is, you know, I looked at, I gave you a little diagram that showed the eight great-grandparents, but a generation back you were up to 16 great-great-grandparents, 32 great-great-great, and 64 fourth great-grandparents. So really the number of ancestors grows so rapidly that, um, you know, we're, we're looking at a very complex uh, situation when we, when we really look at a full family tree. But I, I wanted to be a little bit concrete here and look at one person's family tree. And this is a friend of mine, uh, I'll just call him Roy, that's not his full name. But Roy um, knows a lot about his family tree and he has it sketched out and he gave me this sketch of his family tree. And we see, uh, we Roy, we've got Roy down at the base of the family, his mother Estelle and his, his father was also called Roy. And then we've got some um, grandparents um, written in there, great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents. And so Roy knows the names of many of these individuals and where they lived. And, but he also has, a, has um, linked a kind of a racial identity or ethnic identity with each of these individuals, including himself. And so that's what I put here. And Roy considers himself to be black or African-American, both of his parents to be African-American, but he, um, and his mother's parents to be African-American, but he, uh, he, his understanding is that his father's father uh, was Jewish, and his, father mother, his father's mother was African-American. And going back further in time, um, on his mother's side, he understood one of his great-great-grandparents uh, to be white, um, uh, another to be um, Cherokee, and going back yet one more generation, he, um, he had a Creek ancestor. So he has a lot of information about the sort of the, the identities of these individuals. Of course, he wasn't able to ask all of them. He is attributing this, um, and we, we do that a lot. I think we attribute um, um, characteristics to our ancestors, and he's done this for his, his family tree. And so um, when we look at the genetics, we can, uh, his genetic variation, we can examine it in light of his understanding of his family tree. And so um, what we're trying to do is actually paint Roy's chromosomes just like the ones down here are painted, depending on geographic origin. And so, but how do we do that? We're all really pretty similar to one another, and how do we really have the power to you know, really paint chromosomes based on uh, ancestry, geographic ancestry, when we're all very similar to one another. Well, that 0.5% difference is among us is enough for, to really see some information. And, and I'll show you, so we summarize that, that the differences are, are, are um, our measurements of the genetic differences in lots of different ways, including something called principal components analysis. We've seen a little bit of that already from Jake. Um, there are ways we, we, we make family trees of not just individuals, but also of populations. We, uh, there's some analyses called structure where you actually can analyze data for many individuals and pull out a geographic variation. And I will be focusing on local ancestry inference where you really try to paint a chromosome uh, um, with, with an individual's ancestry at that genetic location. And, this is just a principal components analysis, and it's just, I call this a global pattern of genetic variation. If you take individuals from around the world and you just ask this particular algorithm called principal components analysis to spread them out in a way that sort of mimics the genetic differences um, 
And this is what you will see, um, and, and it's, this, is, this, this pattern comes up repeatedly, that you take any global set of um, individuals and look at their genetic variation, this is kind of what you will get. Kind of this triangle with uh, individuals from Africa in the lower left, um, individuals from Europe and the Middle East um, in the upper left, and then Eastern Asian and Native American individuals, their DNA samples will fall out to the to the right-hand side there. And so it's very much a, a, you know, kind of, it mimics geography. And that is because geography has, has really formed human, patterns of human genetic variation. It's because of the migrations throughout the last tens of thousands of years that we see this pattern. People who live ne near each other are genetically more similar to one another. And that's true all over the world um, because they've had interactions. So, and this, if, and if we go back, you know, 50,000 years or more, we can look at how we've really, our, the history of our, our species is one of people migrating to nearby territories and um, starting somewhere in Africa, we're not absolutely sure where, but um, migrating throughout Africa to different places within Africa, but then also outside, reaching all the way to Australia, reaching to, uh, Eastern, different parts of Eastern Asia, getting into Europe somewhat recently, um, uh, by 35, 40,000 years ago, and then by, you know, 15 to 18,000 years ago, getting all the way into the Americas, all the way down to South America. And this is simply by moving to, you know, people moving, you know, from one place to the next. <coughs> and so over tens of thousands of years, this is the overall migration pattern. And that's the pattern that, that is the hit migration history that led to this pattern of, um, of genetic variation that we see today. But I want to note that um, much of what we're looking at is migrations that have happened in the last 500 years where people have been able to cross oceans, either willingly or unwillingly. I came across an ocean you know, about 40 years ago myself. Um, so um, people, um, but also, uh, I want to keep in mind that people are still moving all over the place. There's a lot of movement still. We're not, you know, static, um, and, and places are changing names, um, groups are changing names, individuals are changing names. So there's still a lot of action as, you know, as people move around our planet for one reason or another. And so, you know, we haven't finished migrating, um, um, so this is kind of an ongoing process. But we're mostly focusing on the last, you know, several hundred years when we're trying to infer ancestry from this pattern. So the main approach that we currently use to infer, to do this local ancestry inference is to slide along any given chromosome. So starting, so um, the numbers on the left indicate probabilities. A probability of one means that we're highly confident in something. Um, so the colors are, are shown down below where we've used the, the red to indicate Western African ancestry, blue is Northern European, the brown is Southern European, the green is Native American. And so s starting at the, the uh, left-hand side of the top bar, so that each of these bars is, is basically a chromosome, so we can say this is an individual's, maybe the mother's chromosome. Um, chromosome one, and sliding along, we see that the first part of the chromosome, there's a high probability, given our, our algorithm and our reference data, that that segment of the chromosome traces back to Western Africa. And then we come to a region where the algorithm is a little confused. It isn't sure if it's Northern Europe or Southern Europe. And so it does not not give a probability of one to either one. Then we come back to a region that, where the algorithm is very confident probability one or close to one, th that that segment traces back to Western Africa. Then we come to a region, the brown region, that looks like it really is strong evidence for tracing to Southern Europe. On the second chromosome below, there's strong evidence for Native American ancestry, then Western African, then Native American with the green, Western African, uh, Northern European, then more Western African. And so this is all done uh, with a machine learning approach um, and uh, where you basically assign probabilities to the ancestry. And the key thing is that uh, we have to compare an individual's genetic information from those chromosomes to that, the, the same chromosomes 
of people from all the different regions around the world. And these are the regions and the reference samples. So I think what if is already started coming out today um, in the discussions earlier is that the, the reference populations that are used for any genetic ancestry inference are kind of critical, are critical. And um, the larger those populations and the more that rich they are in terms of what geographic and, and cultural groups they represent are, are, are critical. And so this is the current state of affairs for, for our approach. And um, so we have three regions within Sub-Saharan Africa, a sample from Northern Africa, and samples from these other regions. And, and they number either in the hundreds or in the thousands. Okay. So now what we, have, we do is then we know people are interested in accuracy and how confident we are in the, in the answer, in the result. And so we choose a threshold, and, and in this case, it's a 70% threshold where we do not call something unless the algorithm is at least 70% confident in that answer. So here, there would be confidence in the Western African to begin, confidence in the Native American, confidence in the next segments of Western African, but then not much confidence in Northern Europe because it doesn't go above the 70% confidence level. And so this allows uh, us and uh, the, someone who obtains this information to kind of get a sense of, or to know how confident we are in, in the, the result, and uh, a very critical point. All right, so, so let's see uh, what happens when we actually apply this to somebody's data. Oh, and so we do a lot of testing of the algorithm, um, and all of this is something we actually report and make available to the recipients. Okay, all right, let me quickly rush through here because to get to some actual information. So this, we, we met Roy earlier, and we see when we paint his chromosomes with, with the ancestry based on genetics, we see this mixture of red and blue bars, uh, Sub-Saharan African and European, and the Jewish ancestry comes through very clearly with the genetic testing. Um, and we can actually add up the different pieces. And this is how you get percents ancestry from different regions, by adding up the lengths of, on, on, along the chromosomes. And so he looks like it's about 50% ancestry tracing to Sub-Saharan Africa, 43% uh, to Europe, to different parts of Europe, different groups in, within Europe. And actually, we can even break it down to what he received from, inherited from his father and his mother. And I don't know if you recall, I mentioned that his father's father was Jewish. And this, we can see here that his, Roy's DNA himself shows that his father was half Jewish, which is exactly what would be predicted by the family tree. And so what we've done here is show how Roy's understanding of his ethnic ancestry is really re recapitulated by his um, genetic analysis. And so this is at least one case where we could see how does it, how does the genetic result hold up compared to paper records and, and other kinds of information as we try to integrate all of this. All right, okay. Um, this is the most common question we get from customers, or one of those most common ones is, can a DNA test prove I have Indian ancestry, Native American ancestry? So. And this is very challenging, so um, it's, it's not something that we say necessarily will prove, but it can give hints of Native American ancestry. So um, now I want to say something. Right now we have uh, over 400,000 customers. People have signed up for a 23andMe service, and uh, this is some indication of the, the, their backgrounds. Um, I was getting that. Um, um, we have over 10,000 African American customers. Many of them have told us their place of birth, um, and they come from different regions in the U.S. So when we look at uh, across uh, 1,600 individuals who actually have self-reported that they consider themselves, identify as black or African American, when we look at their um, ancestry and break it down into different regions, we see a lot of, you know, most, most of them have mostly um, the red, which is Sub-Saharan African. The green is European, so most of them have some European. Some have quite a lot of European ancestry, but it really, really varies. As we heard from Jake just previously, it really varies from one across all the African American individuals. All right, a couple things. The average African ancestry is about 70%. Um, um, and when we break it down, um, we also do some, you might be 
happy to see that um, Ancestry.com and our current state of affairs are very similar. We, lump, we, we have very broad regions such as Western Africa, Eastern and Southern Africa, so we don't really break it down that far and we're working on how to do that. Um, okay, all right, so um, I better just do one more. So, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, exact same statement that, that Jake made, nobody's going to be surprised about that, but, you know, if it came out differently, you might question us, right? <laughs> you might wonder. All right, so European ancestry of African Americans mostly to goes to Northern Europe, a little bit goes to Southern Europe, some to Eastern Europe, and some uh, African Americans show a small amount of Ashkenazi ancestry. All right, okay. So I think we'll stop there and, and let the next speaker get started. Thank you. Well, that's really great, Joanna. Sorry to um, have to interrupt that. Lots of great information. And I know there's a, a bunch on, on the website, too. You guys have demo accounts and other information. Uh, maybe there's other sources you can mention during, during the panel part. But uh, it's my pleasure now to, to introduce Dr. Rick Kittles. Um, who's a professor, been working in this area a long time, and um, I won't bother delaying his start.